busy schedule and making it to the event. It means a lot. Our chief guest for OSMICON 2017, Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, sir, is the current president of the Public Health Foundation of India. He is the president of the National Board of Examination, chairperson on the expert group on universal health coverage set up by the Planning Commission of India. He is a leader in preventive cardiology and in strengthening training, research and policy development also in the field of public health. Words are not enough to describe you, sir. You have been an inspiration to everyone who has been or is a part of Usmania Medical College. We are delighted and have been eagerly waiting for this moment, sir, since four months. We kindly request you now to enlighten us with your words of wisdom and experience. Dignitaries on the dais, luminaries in the audience, distinguished faculty, student organizers, student delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a matter of great pleasure and pride to be back in Hispania Medical College where I had some of the best years of my life. When I'm asked by anybody even in Delhi, as to where I am from, I say I have lived the longer part of my life in Delhi, but the better part of my life in Hyderabad. And one of the reasons for that is the time I spent as a student of Hispania Medical College. One of my seniors, Dr. Yadkiri Chadi, Dr. A.V. Chadi, renowned surgeon in Hyderabad, one year senior to me, used to sing Medicula Kalamanika Mai Velugundam Usmania. Medicula Kalamanika Mai Velugundam Usmania. And if it didn't take it to Uteja Karge, in Nana Karvata, E. College Pramana Loki, Puna Pravation Jason Karvata, Walla Pulakrinch in the past, and I asked Dr. Padiklavi whether the Usmania has a college anthem. She said, no. Perhaps you should get back Dr. Eva Chari and get to write the anthem again and then have it as a college anthem. Thank you very much for inviting me to this function. The young student organizer was very nervous and apologetic when I was called out to the stage and the lights went off. But I told them, that there is no better expression of the fact that you are delighted to see me. Now that we already have the lights on, let me proceed. I am really proud that this particular research symposium was is being organized by Hispania. As Dr. Gopalakrishnagar said, undergraduate research symposia were not a feature of Hispania Medical College in the days he and I studied. Yes, while we were in physiology, we did organize for our class a research symposium in partnership with the National Institute of Nutrition, whose director there was Dr. Gopalan, and our physiology professor, Dr. Simatri, was one of the inspirations for that. But we never had a good research symposium in which research methodology as well as actually conducted research was discussed in depth by undergraduate students. And it's absolutely essential that this becomes another part and parcel of the learning process in a medical college. Now, it is very clear that this particular symposium now, which is being organized particularly this year is very important because it is not only looking at the mechanics of research but also looking at how research can be translated into practice, both in clinical practice and public health practice 
and certainly, of course, you should also be looking at how it can be translated into policy. So, from research to practice, but which also means evidence and empathy-based clinical care. I see that there is a considerable emphasis in one of the sessions on empathetic clinical care, and that's absolutely essential because even as we must benefit from technology, and I'm glad technology is an important feature of this conference, we should not permit technology to build a wall between the clinical care providers and the patients, the families, and the community. The farther we get away from the pulse of the patient, and as we become deaf in our ears to what the patient is actually narrating, then we have a major problem in the ethos of our profession. And that is where we must apply correctives even in terms of empathetic care. In fact, a few centuries ago, somebody said, the duty of a physician is to cure some, relieve most, but to comfort all. Unless the physician is empathetic and is willing to comfort everyone who seeks care, then the physician will be failing in the duty. So that element is also important. I'm happy that you have chosen adolescent health as one of the important themes of this particular conference. Indeed, adolescent health fell by the wayside, even in the Millennium Development Goals. We had one goal on child health, one goal on maternal health, the adolescent, including the adolescent girl, the vital link between child health and maternal health was completely left out. Now that missing link is now being brought back into the Sustainable Development Goals and also into our national program. Our national program on reproductive, maternal, neonatal and child health now has a plus A, that is adolescent health. And adolescence is a very important factor which is a vital link in the life course of an individual. But it's also important that we recognize the promises and perils of adolescence. Quite often, I'm told, on the basis of neurobiology, that the adolescent brain is an immature brain. That is because there are some areas of the cortex which are still maturing, but also the adolescent brain is rapidly pruning of synapses and readapting with fresh synapses before it's still the process of maturation. I would rather describe it as not as an immature brain, but as an evolutionary necessity and an evolutionary success. Because if the adolescent brain is not rapidly pruning off information and acquiring new information from new synapses, there will be no progress, no incremental knowledge, no application of that knowledge for fresh enterprise and discovery. The adolescent brain is also a risk-taking brain, which prizes immediate rewards to future hazards and risks. That again is often portrayed as a sign of immaturity. I beg to differ, because if at the stage of adolescence and young adulthood, if there is no risk taking, there is no enterprise, there is no dis discovery, there is no progress, the society will stagnate in status quo, whether it is young Bill Gates or the entrepreneurs of the Silicon Valley, it is that risk taking that actually advances civilization. But it also comes with perils. The risk taking behavior means rash driving, tobacco, alcohol addictions, and all kinds of other hazards. And I'm shocked to see in the newspapers that Hyderabad is now becoming infamous for drug taking problems in schools. Now, this is where we have to temper and condition the course of adolescence so that actually it moves along in directions which are healthy and health promoting at the same time have uh, enough amount of enterprise for successful careers. I also note the emphasis on stress in this particular convention. It's very really important as far as the physiology and neurobiology, evolutionary biology of stress is concerned, I'm sure you will discuss it sufficiently in the workshop. But where sometimes acute stress is absolutely a necessary survival response, like you have to be alert enough to jump out of a 
the bus that is coming towards you, you can't say that I'm going to be quite relaxed then. At the same time, allowing chronic stress or repetitive acute stress to wear down our body is going to be absolutely dangerous and that's why you'll have to deal with it. Now as medical students, you're bound to have some stress, particularly at the time of examinations, and we have all experienced that. But it's the right amount of stress that is important. I always look at stress as a string musical instrument. If the strings are too loose, you can't make music. If the strings are too taut, you can't make music. You need the right amount of stress to make the right music. So that is how you have to adapt yourself. Okay, that is as far as the themes of this conference are concerned. Now coming to the actual topic of research, because that is what you are addressing at this point in time, I'm not going to really talk about the national health policy or universal health coverage, perhaps some other time. Let me focus on research. I, when Dr. Paritpani asked me several times along with your students to write a message for the souvenir, I thought messages and souvenirs are seldom read. There won't be a formality for the students to gather money from the sponsors. However, because there was considerable insistence, I did write a piece which spells out my views on the romance the rigor, the rewards, and risks of research. So those of you who would like to read it, please read it. I'm not going to repeat that here. But let me first address the question as to why students like you must be interested in research. Because you're going to be requiring it as producers of research and knowledge. You're going to be requiring it as consumers of knowledge, as people who are applying that knowledge in very many ways in your practice. And so thirdly, even as critics and evaluators of knowledge, you'll be asked to evaluate research projects for funding. You'll be asked to evaluate publish research for publication in journals. So you have to understand research methodology with all its complexity. Now, there are three things about research that you must understand. One is the purpose of research. The second is the process of research, and the third is the products of research. Now the purpose of research is not self-gratification. We may want to publish, we may want to get great reputation as scientists, but that is not the fundamental purpose of research. The fundamental purpose of research is social benefit and advancing new knowledge. Unless our research is tailored to alter society in order to provide benefits to society in multiple fields, in our case, in terms of better health, it is failing in its duty. As I said, without social relevance, science is sterile. At the same time, policies and programs and clinical practice guidelines, which are not based on the firm foundations of science, will crumble on clay feet. So you need to link research to its application. At the same time, you need to open up new areas. You also therefore need some open-ended research which can explore new ideas and bring about some new frontiers open. However, much of research is to test out hypothesis, not just go on a fishing expedition or kite flying. And that brings us to the process of research. The process of research begins first by asking the right kind of question. What is your research question? Unless you frame your research question correctly, the research is likely to be very misguided. And all of health research is essentially causation research. Does this intervene, does this risk factor cause this disease? Does this medicine cause improvement and reduction in mortality? Does this diagnostic test cause a person's disease to be better diagnosed or earlier diagnosed? This is all causation research. But in causation research, you have to contend with a number of factors. Chance, which you discuss always, is this observed result by chance? What is the probability that it arose because of chance alone, which is your p-value? 
The others are bias, confounding, what is the effect of other covariates, how do you adjust for all of those to try and find out whether there is a valid independent effect of the factor that you are studying. All of these require understanding of research methodology. And that's very important to understand right from your student days, but even as you advance into post-graduation, please understand that without good research methodology, research, however meticulously done, is unlikely to be flawed. And we see even now, even in leading journals like New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet, a number of articles which are published with great fanfare being refuted or being even withdrawn few years later because some of the methodology was not very good. Therefore, we have to ask the right question, but we also have to be very objective in conducting our research. The philosopher Karl Popper said, the scientific method is to gather facts in a systematic manner, conjecture a hypothesis, and then to set about proving the hypothesis wrong that means you are supposed to try and prove your own hypothesis wrong and accept it as being possibly true only when you do your best to prove it wrong and cannot prove it wrong. That means the scientist has to be very skeptical about his or her own potential biases and hypothesis. And that's why the whole idea of the alternate hypothesis comes in. And of course the role of chance is very important because chance is the eternal alternate hypothesis. But then we often find a lot of speculation. From very minor facts, we find a huge amount of speculation coming up in journals and that gets distorted in the media and then we get wrong messages being sent out to the public and it becomes the duty of the medical profession not only to understand research but to interpret it correctly to the media and to the public. And that's why again you must understand research. Mark Twain, as you know, in the famous humorous writer. He once did a couple of pieces on the length of the Mississippi River and also on another piece humorously from a small fact. He said he could prove that the moon is hotter than the sun or the sun is cooler than the moon. And then he writes, there is something fascinating, fascinating about science. You can generate vast or wholesale returns of conjecture from trifling investments of fact. And a gentleman called Danny Kay, who used to be a cockamamian in Hollywood films in the 1950s said, the only way scientists get their exercise is by jumping to conclusions. Now we don't want to be those kind of scientists. We want to be scientists who are honest in our work, who question ourselves, question our colleagues, and then ultimately advance truth to its nearest approximation. And there again, too much of data dredging is not correct. We become worshippers of this p-value and then see tables with multiple p-values. The problem is each time you are examining a data set for a p-value, you are playing with chance. And you can generate 20 different p-values and get one positive or even two by chance. Therefore, you have to be very careful about that. And the perils of multiple significance testing are quite huge. So also you must make sure that your statistical power is adequate to discover truth when it is there. There was a trial done by a very good trialist in the 1970s on role of coronary care units, do they save patients or not, compared to a general medical unit. They did the study and said, no, coronary care units are useless, they have no additional benefit over a general medical unit. And it was found that was because they did not have ad adequate statistical power. They had calculated the, the sample size based on an expected 50% reduction in mortality. So even if there's a 25% or a 30% reduction in mortality, that study misses it. So you have to have adequate statistical power. But then, if you inflate your sample size too much, even minor effects turn out to be statistically significant. That is why you must also find out what is the actual effect size? Is something which is statistically significant also clinically significant? What are the confidence intervals? What is the number needed to treat? All of these are now part of the research methodology. Nobody just goes by the p-value. 
to understand all of that is very important. Similarly, when you are looking at risk assessment, we often talk about relative risk. Relative risk only tells you how much a person who is exposed to a particular risk factor or an intervention is developing the disease or benefiting from the intervention as opposed to somebody who is not. But it doesn't tell, that's about groups of patients, but it doesn't tell you what that particular individual is going to have, that's where absolute risk comes in. It doesn't tell you how prevalent that risk factor is in the population and how important it is to control that for public health reasons. That's where something called population attributable risk comes in. I'm not going to take a statistics class here, but the fact is, unless you understand this, it is easy to get misguided by publications. If you have to be an intelligent interpreter of research evidence, of journals, then you have to understand research methodology. And the Indian Council of Medical Research is now proposing to start courses in research methodology in about 50 government medical colleges across the country. I believe Usmania should connect with Dr. Samya Swaminathan and ensure that Usmania too is part of that group. Similarly, in case of diagnostic tests, we often believe if a diagnostic test is positive, disease is there, if it is negative, disease is not there. We know that's not true. It's all a matter of estimating probabilities in terms of sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, likelihood ratios, receiver operating curve, and so on. So in all our lives, we are dealing with uncertainty, and nowhere so more than in medicine. So what we need to do through research is to narrow down the estimates and increase the probability that we are closer to the truth. So that is where you have to understand research methodology and apply it appropriately. At the same time, you have to look at incremental benefits and cost effectiveness. You may have 10 different diagnostic tests, but throwing all of them at the patient may not be cost effective. So when you apply a couple of tests, what is the probability that you have reached of a particular person having disease? What is the incremental value of adding some more tests? Must you do these tests simultaneously or sequentially? All of this is application of your research methodology. So all of this is becoming very important whether you are a practicing clinician or whether you are actually conducting a clinical trial or trying to publish a paper. Finally, let me tell you that the three important questions that you have to ask are the so what question, then what question, and what then question. So what is, when you frame your research question, it may appear very attractive to you, but then you must say, what will be the implication of this if I find this result? Will it make a reasonable difference to clinical practice, to public health, to health policy? If it does not, it is not worth investing money, not worth investing your time. So the rationale has to be very strong there. And then what is, how do you translate that research result into standard management guidelines, clinical care pathways, and then try and build in that evidence into regular clinical practice. The what then is how do you evaluate the difference that has been made? Have those clinical practice guidelines been widely adopted? Has it made a difference to patient management? Has it made a difference to patient outcomes? All of those, the evaluation part is also important. All this is part of the research pathway. And unless you begin to appreciate all of this from your undergraduate career, by the time you get into post-graduation and you're forced, and I use the word forced, forced to do research as a PG medical student in a medical MD degree or an MS degree or a DNP program at the National Board of Health Examinations, you will go through the research mechanically without understanding the problems of that research. And if we produce bad research results, then we are polluting the literature and causing more harm to science, more harm to cause to health. On the other hand, if as young medical students we appreciate the importance of conducting good research and of critically appraising published research and being very careful in adopting the right kind of research into clinical and public health practice, then you will be advancing science, you will be advancing health policy, you will be advancing health practice, 
and you'll be making a huge difference to society, which is what we are all about. So, like Henry VIII said to his second wife, I'll not keep you long. I'll come to the end of my talk. I'll only say, as Louis Pasteur said to his research fellows, keep your enthusiasm, but let strict verification be its constant companion. Thank you. All the best. I request the delegates to kindly wait for another 10 minutes. The ceremony is about to get over. Our students have been eagerly waiting to ask you a few questions, sir, if it pleases you. It's an anticipated day. I'm not the president of the National Board of Examinations any longer. I completed my five-year term in October 2014. So any complaints you have with regard to NP, I will not be able to defend myself now. I don't need to defend myself now. But any general questions on education, medical education, which I believe you want to ask, I'll be happy to answer to the best of my knowledge and to the limitations of my knowledge. I am Janaki of Kudir Raj. My question is, with reference to the abolishment of MCI and setting up of new regulatory bodies, what are the changes recommended in medical education? The less I say about the MCI, the better. is unparliamentary terms in this gathering. But as you know, the MCA has not distinguished itself in the governance of medical education in this country. And we also see a lot of problems associated with inadequacy in the numbers of doctors in this country, partly because of the way medical colleges were licensed or registered to conduct and we also see a huge disparity in medical colleges across the country. Some states have very many, some states have very few. But the idea of actually having the National Medical Commission came up in 2009 when it was proposed to have a National Commission on Medical, uh, on Health Professional Education under the Health Ministry and the National Commission on Higher Education and Research under the HRP Ministry. At that time, both the ministries fought on who should control medical education. But finally, it was decided that the health ministry will do it, but then the bill had to be re-adapted. It went through several stages, and like finally now, with fresh complaints pouring in about MCI, the Honorable Prime Minister asked the former Deputy Chairman of uh, Niti Ayo, Dr. Panagariya, to head a committee, and they drafted a bill for National Medical Commission, which now is approved as a cabinet note and is about to be going before the parliament, where it will probably be referred to a standing committee on health for its comments. And of course, it will come up for public debate as well. The idea of setting this is partly to remove the flaws in the electoral process of the MCI, where it was not adequately reflecting the number of medical colleges in this country as people who could vote. Also, it was felt that some distinguished academics who are not likely to contest these elections must also be brought in in the interest of medical education. So they are bringing about now a balance between elected members and non-elected members. But much more importantly, it will have a say both in the curriculum reforms as well as in reforms in the accreditation system as well as the examination system. Of course, even anticipating that, the so-called need has been brought about as a policy instrument. What was proposed in 2009 was that actually the National Commission should be for health professional education, covering nursing, dental, and other forms of health professional education as well. But now it's likely that separate councils will continue for them, and even the allied health professionals will have a separate council. But at least in terms of medical education, I see the National Medical Commission, even with some defects in the framing, as a great step forward for reforming medical education and redeeming it from the kind of mess that it has fallen into. To know if these changes would be able to fulfill the need of the country's education towards the UG to PG ratio of 1 is to 1? Well, basically, UG to PG one is to one is something that people like Dr. Devishetri are pushing very actively. 
we have to look at how much of a requirement that is. We do certainly need many more postgraduates uh, seats or opportunities for postgraduate training. And that's why we're talking about DNB and CPS programs in district hospitals and so on. But we also need basic MBBS doctors and general practitioners. Of course, if you set up family medicine as a widely uh, taught and practice speciality across medical colleges, then having a UG going to family medicine will meet the requirements of primary care. Otherwise, if you turn out everybody into a specialist, then primary care will be abandoned. And that is where we have to find the right ratios. But yes, in terms of increasing postgraduate opportunities, the increasing number of postgraduate seats in medical colleges is happening. New medical colleges are also being proposed. But in addition, ENB and CPS programs are now going to be set up in many district hospitals and uh, which are going to be upgraded. And it's good because that way the district hospitals will get strengthened as well. Morning, sir. I'm Abhilash from Osman Medical College. How will these changes exactly affect the nation's health scenario? The, ch the changes in the new medical commission, how will these changes affect the country's health scenario? National health scenario is dependent upon a number of factors. Firstly, there are also social determinants of health. Everything is not dependent only on medical care. You have water, sanitation, environment, nutrition, all of which have a very great impact on health. Pollution, road safety, all of these have a great impact on health. So, National Medical Commission will not be able to tackle that. But you, as health professionals, should be able to influence those policies as well. The duty of a health professional is to elucidate as a researcher, educate as a teacher, alleviate as a clinical care provider, advocate as an activist, and if necessary, agitate as a concerned citizen. So on air pollution, we have to agitate. On other things, we have to bring about changes as well. But if we, through the National Medical Commission, bring about reforms in our medical education with a greater emphasis on primary care related skills and motivation, if we actually bring a good link from between different levels of care and also bring about greater number of postgraduate specialities which are now in short supply and make sure that there are more anesthetists and obstetricians and community health centers. All of those will be good changes that will improve the health situation in this country. So, tailoring the needs of medical education, tailoring the medical education and the portfolio of offerings in medical education to the health needs of the country is something that will not happen in that way. Medical education was not health system connected. So you need to connect that. And that is where the National Medical Commission can make a difference. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. We are studying MBBS abroad and we are aware that we are going to get a screening test when we come back to India. And recently we heard that there is go there will be going to be a uh, exit exam for uh, MBBS graduates in India also. And we would like to hear some suggestions from you, sir. When I was president of NBE, was to deal with the complaints of parents, politicians, and even ministers about the low pass percentage of students training in foreign medical colleges and coming back to India. We tried our best to improve that situation partly by making the questions much more clinical and application oriented. We said people may not be able to remember everything that they've studied in their five years. Can we get more applied anatomy questions set by surgeons, more pharmacology and applied physiology questions set by physicians and things like that, changing the balance a bit so that that becomes easier, problem solving type of questions. The results did improve. They jumped up from about 10% to 23 to 25%. But that is not the only problem. There is a problem of variable quality of education abroad 
and also how relevant it is to the Indian context. There are many colleges abroad, they cannot be teaching Kalaza. On the other hand, a student from Bihar has to know Kalaza. So there are issues there. Thirdly, the size of medical colleges. We were told that in China, the average class size for medical students, foreign medical students, is 900 in Dr. Consigl Hall. I was told the largest class size was 2000. When I told this to Mr. Gulam Nabi Adhan, he said, this class is a public meeting. Hai. So, of course, the politician was happy to do so in public meeting. But the question is, you have to overcome these deficiencies. What is now being proposed is, when the students come back, they will be support given to them for orienting them to the Indian curriculum and bringing them a little more close to the kind of questions that will be asked in terms of the content. And they will also have to appear for the same type of examination as now is going to be common for uh, medical undergraduates coming out of Indian medical colleges. The same common exit exam. So if they, therefore there is going to be no differential standard. So that is what is being proposed now by the government.